Today is, um, we're going to hear the good news. The good news about the saving love that we have through Jesus Christ. And that's something you would come to expect when you come to worship, is that you would come to expect to hear the good news. But what about those who are outside the church today? How do they hear the good news? Until recently, I was a bit of a passive missionary. I was quite happy to let others do the work, to let those specially trained to be evangelists or pastors, or I put my trust in programs that the church would run, even Alpha, which I was a leader. I expected people to come to me. But I truly believe that we're all being given that great commission to go. And it wasn't until recently that I, um, after attending the, uh, the cross-cultural ministry uh, conference in Melbourne, with Pastor Tim came along to that too, uh, and since reading this book, and I haven't quite finished it, I'm getting to the how-to-do part now, that I've become more intentional with my ministry, with my mission work. And that, what does that mean? Well, it means I can't do it by my own power. I have to rely on this, the power of God. So I start now, every day, I start with a prayer and I say, God, please reveal me your plans for, for my neighbourhood. Please include me in, in those plans. Show me the people that you want me to speak to to share the good news with. And surprisingly, the first time I did that, I had an opportunity to, um, to share with someone. Well, not sh well, I didn't get an opportunity to share the gospel, but I got an opportunity to do service for someone across the street from me. God answered my prayer that first day. Nothing much has happened since, but I start my day now with intention to, in going out and doing God's work and missionary. And today, we hear in today's reading, especially in the Romans reading, I'll just read it to you. How can people have faith in the Lord and ask, the, ask him to save them? If they have never heard about him, how can they hear unless someone tells them? And how can anyone tell them without being sent by the Lord? The scriptures say it is a beautiful sight to see the feet of someone coming to preach the good news. We're about to start a second service. But that second service won't bring people to that service. It will, re it will require us to go and give gospel to people and then they will come. I truly believe if we all become intentional missionaries, we'll have no problem filling this church. No problem at all. Let's begin this service in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The word is near you, on your lips and in your heart. Because if you confess with your lips, that is Jesus' is Lord. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. We pray the psalm for today, Psalm 85, verses 8 to 13. I will listen to what God the Lord says. He, he promises peace to his people, his faithful servants. But let them not turn to folly. Surely his salvation is near those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Love and faithless, faithfulness meet together. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness springs forth from the earth, and righteousness looks down from heaven. The Lord will indeed give what is good, and our land will yield its harvest. 
Righteousness goes before him and prepares the way for his steps. Show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. The Lord be with you. Thank you. Let us pray. Let us pray that we may be defended in doubt and difficulty. Merciful Father, your Son Jesus Christ gave up his life so that we might die to self and live in him. Give us such close fellowship with him that in all doubts and dangers our faith may not fail. We ask this through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We now listen to God's word. Our first reading is from Kings chapter 19, verses 9 to 18, where Elisha spent the night there in a cave. And the Lord appears to Elijah. While Elijah was on Mount Sinai, the Lord asked, Elijah, why are you here? He answered, Lord God, all-powerful, I have always done my best to obey you, but your people have broken their solemn promise to you. They have torn down your altars and killed all your prophets except me. And now they're even trying to kill me. Go out and stand on the mountain, the Lord replied. I want you to see me when I pass by. All at once, a strong wind shook the mountain and shattered the rocks. But the Lord wasn't in the wind. Next, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was, wasn't in the earthquake. And then there was a fire, but the Lord wasn't in the fire. Finally, there was a gentle breeze, and when Elijah heard it, he covered his face with his coat. He went out and stood at the entrance to the cave. The Lord asked, Elijah, why are you here? Elijah answered, Lord God all-powerful, I have always done my best to obey you, but your people have promised, broken their solemn promise to you. They have torn down your elders, el altars and killed all your prophets except me, and now they are even trying to kill me. And the the Lord said, Elijah, you go back to the desert near Damascus, and when you get there, appoint Hazel to be king of Syria. Then appoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, to be the king of Israel, and Elisha, son of Saphat, to take your place as my prophet. Hazel will start killing the people who worship Baal. Jehu will kill those who escape from Hazel, and Elisha will kill those who escape from Jehu. But 7,000 Israelites have refused to worship Baal, and they will live. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading is from Romans chapter 10, verses 5 to 15. Anyone can be saved. Now Moses said that a person could become acceptable to God by obeying the law. He did this when he wrote, If you want to live, you must do all the law commands. But people whose faith makes them acceptable to God will never ask, Who will go up to heaven to bring Christ down? Neither will they ask, Who will go down into the world of the dead to raise him to life? All who are acceptable because of their faith may simply say, the message is as near as your mouth or your heart, and this same message we preach about faith. So you will be saved if you honestly say, Jesus is Lord, and you believe with all your heart that God raised him from death. God will accept you and save you if you truly believe this and Tell it to others. The scriptures say that no one who has faith will be disappointed, no matter if that person is a Jew or a Gentile. There is only one Lord, and he is generous to everyone who asks for his help. 
All who call out to the Lord will be saved. How can people have faith in the Lord and ask him to save them if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear unless somebody tells them? And how can anyone tell them without being sent by the Lord? The scriptures say it is a beautiful sight to see even the feet of someone coming to preach the good news. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And our gospel comes from Matthew 14, verses 22 to 33, where Jesus walks on the water. Right away, Jesus made his disciples get into a boat and start back across the lake. But he stayed until he had seen the crowds sent away. Then he went up on a mountain where he could be alone and pray. Later that evening, he was still there. By this time, the boat was a long way from shore. It was going against the wind and was being tossed about by the waves. A little while before morning, Jesus came walking on the water towards his disciples. When they saw him, they thought he was a ghost. They were terrified and started screaming. At once, Jesus said to them, Don't worry. I am Jesus, don't be afraid. And Peter replied, Lord, if it is really you, tell me to come to you on the water. Come on, Jesus said. Peter then got out of the boat and started walking on the water towards him. But when Peter saw how strong the wind was, he was afraid and started sinking. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Right away, Jesus reached out his hand helped up Peter and said, you surely don't have much faith. Why do you doubt? When Jesus and Peter got into the boat, the wind died down. The men in the boat worshipped and said, you really are the Son of God. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for showing yourself as the Son of God. Help us always to trust and worship you. Amen. Hoping there would be some kids here today. And I was going to play Blind Men's Bluff with them. Right? So, you're probably thinking, well, what's that got to do with anything? Well, I was going to relate it to the Gospel reading. I was going to say that reminds me of today's Gospel reading when Peter took his eyes off of Jesus. And he started listening to all the voices in his own head and he was getting fearful. He was seeing the waves come up and he realised it's not natural for man to walk on water. And he started doubting himself and doubting Jesus even. And what happened? He started to sink. And I was going to say to the kids, sometimes we listen to voices and we get pulled this way and that way, just like in Blind Men's Bluff. You hear the voice, here I am, here I am, and they run over to him, they can't find him. And it's just like that for Peter. He was listening to all those voices in his head and started to doubt. And what happened? He started to sink. But who reached out his hand and saved him? It was Jesus. That's the good news. And that's what we're going to hear about in today's sermon, the good news of Jesus Christ. I'm a bit sad that there's no kids here. I was looking forward to having a game. Yeah. Oh, well. I could have played with you big kids, couldn't I? Not very often you get to play a game in church, is it? Uh, Okay. Let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we pray today that your good news will touch our hearts. And motivate us to tell others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today's sermon is not my sermon again. It comes from the LCA website. And as I said before, I don't have any idea who wrote the sermon. They just give a list of pastors' names. So, but, um, so that's where it comes from. And I just want to remind you that the opening verses I didn't write... Uh, just reinforcing again, so don't look at my shoes. 
It's got nothing to do about what I'm about to read. But I did wash my feet this morning. I had a shower. So they are clean anyway. So the, the, today's sermon comes from Romans chapter 10, verses 5 to 15. How beautiful are the feet of those announcing the good news. Paul says, remember it's not me, I wash my feet in the morning with shower gel, which smell, smells pretty flash, um, and I'm wearing newly polished shoes, but I wouldn't think I'm, I, I'm sorry, but I wouldn't think of my feet as beautiful. I'm thankful that Paul isn't really focusing on feet, but on the message of good news that they carry. He cites Isaiah chapter 52, verse 7. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings. You proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. Here, Isaiah is speaking to God's people who are in captivity to the superpower of the day, Babylon. Israel's captivity was God's judgment upon them because of their persistent idolatry. But God sends his heralds to them to proclaim to them that he has had mercy on them and that their hard service is over. He is the Lord who reigns over them, the mightiest world power. And he will deliver them from the hand of the Babylonians. The passage pictures the joy of those in captivity. At the thought of the herald of runners speeding over the mountains to make the great announcement to them that they are free. As they welcomed God's messengers so joyfully, they welcomed with joy, God himself. And as, and as they delighted in the message of these heralds, they delighted in God's own word, and they, and they are righteous through faith in what God has promised. Righteousness through faith and how God is at work in creating faith are core themes of Paul's teaching today. Paul begins by referring to the Old Testament. Moses writes concerning the righteousness which is from the law, that the person that the person who does them will live sorry, that the person who does them will live in them. In other words, if anyone wants to establish a relationship with God through the law, they must forever maintain that relationship by complete and perfect doing. The Pharisees did seek this path, and in their attempt to earn righteousness by obedience to the law, they made up their own laws, which they thought would help them keep what God had commanded them. Instead, they, they, instead, they only obscured it. For example, they ruled that one must wash their hands before eating so that they wouldn't make the food entering the stomach ritually unclean and therefore defile themselves before God. So when they saw Jesus' disciples not doing this, they took exception. But Jesus taught them, it is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth that defiles a person. What, whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is, and is expelled. But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile anyone. 
That comes from Matthew verses 11 and 17 to 20. Righteousness by the law is impossible because the issue is one of the heart, which is what the Pharisees hadn't understood. It's not what goes inside a person that makes them unclean to God's sight. It is what's all... It is what is already there that makes one unclean. The sinful heart and everything that comes out of it. Harmful thoughts, hurtful words, disruptive actions, self-focus, pride, unwillingness to forgive or to seek forgiveness, judging others. Everything in which we take our eye, when we take our eye, which sorry everything in which we take our eyes off Christ, like Peter in today's gospel. The law of Moses can only show us how a righteous and holy God demands us to live. It therefore shows us that we are all that we all fall well short of God's requirement, and that God is right in just in His just sentence of death upon us as sinners. The law of Moses helps us, but only in so far as it shows us our need for a saviour outside ourselves, of ourselves, but it can never be the law that is our saviour. So Paul says that trying to be perfectly righteous by works would be just as impossible as someone going up to heaven to bring Christ down or descending into the depths to bring him up who would be able to do that but God didn't leave us to struggle by ourselves to be lost to constant failure and guilt he gave you Christ who has done it all for you Christ is the one who has lived perfectly. He is the Lamb of God who shed his precious and holy blood on the cross to to take away the sin of the world. After he descended into hell to proclaim his victory to the underworld, that, that he, the living Lord, had rescued the world from the clutches of the devil and the kingdom of darkness is and that the kingdom of darkness is under his power and authority, he ascended into heaven to open the way for, the, for mere mortals to live with him in, in heavenly glory forever. Christ shows us a gracious, merciful and loving God, a compassionate God, who does for sinners what they cannot do for themselves, rescuing us from our captivity to unclean hearts of sin, death and the devil. There are no distinctions whether we are Jew or Greek, whichever suburb or rural town in which we live. Paul says that the same Lord is Lord, Lord of all, and and richly blesses all who call on him, because whoever calls on him will be saved. That is the righteousness part from the law, the righteousness that comes through faith in Christ. But how do we get faith? How do you come to know and trust in Christ? You wouldn't know about Jesus and God's divine help and favour for, for you in him unless it were not in his word. And you wouldn't hear this word if it were not proclaimed and read and taught to you. So not only has God sent his son, but he sent his prophets and apostles to pass on his saving truth to all people through the scriptures 
and your pastors and your teachers to preach and teach this saving truth to you. I think it goes a lot further than that too. It would be your parents, your godparents, your family members who also shared that word with you. You have to witness to God's word by these faithful Christians, God involved in your life, through whom you come to through whom you came to learn of the forgiveness of sins, life and peace with God in Christ. But God has given you so much more than merely information. At the beginning of Romans, Paul puts it this way, the gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes the gospel is a power because it's God's own word. As his herald speak, so too God is present and speaking. A few weeks ago we heard through Isaiah that the word that goes out of God's mouth will accomplish everything that he desires it, desires for it. That's good because our hearts are spiritually darkened and dead to sin and are bound by it. In our natural state, we just can't be by our own strength simply... Sorry. In our natural state, we just can't by our own strength simply decide to trust in Christ and his truth and therefore be counted among the righteous. We need completely new hearts to be able to receive with joy the good news. Through those preaching and teaching and sharing the gospel, Christ and his spirit are present and at work, just as they were when, when God spoke creation into existence out of nothing. Christ and his spirit are present where God speaks today, making their home in those who hear. Paul says today, the word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. Since the day he baptised you, Christ and his spirit are at work through those who have spoken his word and his kingdom has come, transforming you by giving you a new heart. A new heart that would yearn for Christ and trust in him and his cross for life and peace with God forever. A new heart that would gladly hear and learn and follow God's word. A new heart that would mourn over sin and hunger and thirst for righteousness. A new heart that would receive the good news with joy like the Israelites rejoiced in the message and the feet of those through whom God brought it to them. Christ and his spirit are at work in the new heart. God gives his people to, what, to want to declare the wonders of God. Just as King David sung in Psalm 51 verse 15, O Lord, open my lips and my mouth. Sorry, Lord, open my lips and my mouth will tell of your praise. From the new hearts our Lord gives us comes an entirely new life direction in which our mouths contrast the profanities and blasphemies those of the world utter. God would instead lead us to confess Jesus as Lord over all and call out to him for the saving help he promises. We, knew, we, do, not, we do not call out to become saved we call out because God has already saved us through his word and spirit at work in us. It is from this new heart that you are able and willing to confess the faith. So if you don't wash your hands before you eat, it'll be okay. <laughs> Disgusting, but okay. Sure. 
you could get gastro, but, a, but on a spiritual level, you'll be, the right, you'll, you'll be righteous before God because your standing before him is not dependent on what goes in your mouth into your stomach, but what comes out of your mouth, generated from your heart. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. What salvation means is nothing less than a daily relationship with the one who spoke the universe the one who spoke the universe into being and looks upon you with divine favour and showers you with all the riches of Christ. It means Jesus, Father is your own and, and you have peace with him. It means that God walks with you by your side and guides your steps and hearts and hearts all your prayers for Jesus, for Jesus' sake. It means God comforts you in times of distress and promises that nothing will separate you from his love. And he will work all things together for good. It means you will, not, you will by no means be put to shame by the accusation of others or God's law or Satan himself because Christ will continue to richly bless you whose hearts are directed to him and mouths confess his name. Then on that last day, he will raise your bodies to ascend with him in glory forever, where together with all the other saints and angels, you will join in singing together, blessing and glory and wisdom, and thanksgiving and honour and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Sing for 
Mountains bow down and the sea 